I'm Tim Ellis. Thank you for joining us for Laneway Live. Tonight's guest is not just a magician, but also a writer. He's written for shows like Rugrats and Everybody Loves Raymond, and he's just released a brand new book called Interpreting Magic. Please welcome David Regal. Oh, we've just caught oh, you. Caught you on our way. Oh, was that today? Yes, oh. yes. I'm glad. I was just here in my in my library with a with a curtain in the back. Yeah. What 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 do you happen to be reading just there? What's your what's your coronavirus reading material? It's, it's my book, Interpreting Magic. Wow. Look, it's big. It has color photos. It's no no. I'm sorry. That's crass. I'll just put it down. Oh, it really is large. <laughs> it must be full of really great material. Well, you know, uh, in all seriousness, Tim, it's been 10 years since I did a book before. No a one ever goes into writing a magic book with a dream of great riches. No one says, hey, honey, don't worry. This year, I'm writing a magic book. You do it because you, you love it and you hope to contribute and all that. And uh, the book has been embraced. I'm very happy to say that. And it's gotten uh, as good reviews as I as, I haven't forgotten for anything. It's this edition is essentially sold out. There's another printing coming along on a boat uh, as as we speak. And I say this honestly, not to brag. I don't even say say this with happiness. I say this, Tim, with relief, <laughs> just relief, because uh, I don't know if it's my psychological makeup, but. I'm prepared for everything to go south every step of the way, including when this is coming across you know, international waters to reach me. I'm imagining, I'm literally having dreams about sinking boats <laughs> and copies of my book just falling into the sea. But if it arrived and everything worked out, so that's good. So is this the, uh, the whole uh, Jewish mantra of hope for the best, expect the worst? I think, well, first of all, yes, I am Jewish. And I almost said, maybe it's because I'm Jewish and I figured, Maybe I shouldn't say that, but yeah, you let the cat out of the bag. It could be a Jewish thing. It could be. Because there is that whole, you know, racial memory. It's this whole thing everyone goes through with anxiety and generally, not not 100%, but it's, yeah, I, I generally loathe myself and re I'm filled with regret and second guessing. And yeah, but you know, it, it, it's all okay. Well, your, your, your website is headed David Regal, magician, writer, Jew. So, That's true. So and my son, is, my son is redoing the website for me as we speak, but it's, we're retaining that because right. yeah, people seem to amuse. So, so yeah, why not? So, so you are, your, your main income does not come from magic, but from writing. Well, it's interesting. I've never, you know, it's, uh, I have a couple of kids. I don't know what to tell them about how to make a living because I'm not sure how I did it. But I got involved uh, with a comedy group in New York when I was in my 20s. And that group was uh, successful to a point where we all made a living wage. Now, we weren't rich, but making a living wage in New York doing nothing but a comedy show was unique. I mean, the next most popular comedy group paid everyone nothing. <laughs> so it's like living wage, nothing and we were making a living wage and i think for a variety of reasons we had a nice location was probably helping we and taking myself out of the equation it was a very strong group and i think it's true uh when we see a magic show made up of different performers the same uh truism applies when people have different strengths the whole generally uh uh it doesn't suffer. 
you know, having a lot of people with the same strength, sometimes the whole does suffer. But uh, our comedy group, no one was showing up on that stage doing what somebody else did. And it was that mix that it made it fun for me to go to work because there was just something interesting every day about being with this group of people. So I was doing that. And then after about six years of that, some people in the group, you know, were ruffling the feathers of other people in the group and it started to splinter. And I got a job in New York for a while, uh, working for a TV company. And then that became very officious. I didn't think that was uh, my calling to have this officious job. So uh, my wife was a real sport because we had kids by then. I snuck out to Los Angeles and pitched things. And I got a show into development, which if it sounds great, it really isn't. It just means generally they pay you nothing for like a six month free option and you try to sell it to the next person. And eventually I moved out to Los Angeles and kept doing the same thing. So that's why I stumbled my way into the world of writing. Because after something I you know, got into development fell through for whatever reason, oh, I remember, um, everyone at Tribune Entertainment, which is a big company in the United States, everyone that I knew was fired. It was like one of those bloodlettings you hear about. You open the paper, oh, half of Tribune was fired. And it was the half that knew me. So the, you know, the show that I had sold them wasn't gonna go anywhere. And someone mentioned that a person in New York associated with my comedy group after I had left, was doing very well on TV. I should contact this person. I said, I don't know this person. That was after I left. And this wise friend of mine said, but he knows you. So yeah, I sort of, by hook and by crook, moved my family from the East Coast to the West Coast, started getting writing jobs, and then you become like a writer-producer. It's almost like a pecking order, as if all these different shows were owned by the same corporation. They're not. But this kind of an understanding that the longer you hang in there, they'll, you know, give you a slightly better credit, slightly better salary. Some jobs are union, which are great. Some jobs are non-union, generally not as great. And in general, most people that come out here have a mix. Some people are very lucky and they only work on very high-end shows. I've always been a mix, been a working man and just so many different jobs. But now my kids are out of school. Everything's good. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure now. You can do what you love. I'm emancipated. I mean, that's the feeling. So um, you, you've been writing in Hollywood for uh, a lot of shows, and so you've got good connections with what's going on. But uh, you were mentioning in conversations beforehand that uh, Hollywood at the moment is shut down. Yeah, it's absolutely shut down. And even things in production have stopped production. And it hurts different people to different degrees. Depends how much money you make, obviously, because either you have a lot of money in the bank or you're living paycheck to paycheck. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of people making money uh, in the entertainment business, big money. But in general, people show up for work every day and make uh, some amount of money. I'll give you uh, an example of what I mean. And the point of this story is not everyone in show business is filthy rich driving sports cars with these you know, palatial uh, mansions. That uh, is a reality, but it's not a reality for most people. I was on a, a network sitcom, NBC, a big, big network, and it was a show with Whoopi Goldberg, big star, and we were having a guest star that week. And I won't say the name of the guest star because I'm about to tell you something personal about this person. But this is a guest star. That means they're the focus of that week's episode. They have a big part. The story hinges on what they do. And this person was award-winning. This person had been on a sitcom before, a star of a sitcom before, had been on the stage, an established actor. I found out what that actor was getting paid for that week of work, $5,000. And this actor was not doing like 12 of those guest spots that year. It was probably just that one, maybe another. So these are not great riches. Even some you know, well-known people uh, are earning. Uh, needless to say, people do make riches. But most people 
who are actors, most people who are writers, we're in there working and when a show goes down or stops production, it's bad news for most people. It's, I wonder what, what's coming around the corner. And you just hang on tight. No one likes losing a gig. Yeah, so how- uh, And of course, all the magicians we know are out of work. Oh, of course, of course. Yeah. <laughs> and some of them who were working in Vegas, headlining in Vegas, uh, in, well, not headlining, but working in shows in Vegas and earning up to 80 to to $100 a night, they're now out of that even. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. Uh, and, you know, I, for the past six years, I've been one of the producers of, it's an American show, The Carbonaro Effect with Michael Carbonaro, very talented uh, we should put, I'll put a link down, down there for people who want to have a Oh, look. it's all over YouTube if people don't get it on their uh, systems. But I've really enjoyed working on that show, even though that happened to be a non-union show. It's a unique show in, in my life because I love the show. Very often, people that write on shows don't watch the shows because <laughs> it's, you know, you're slogging through and making a living. But Carbonaro Effect, I watch every episode. I really, uh, really love the show. I love what everyone's managed to do with the show. And, you know, there was talk about it continuing on, but now with this virus, who knows? And so, you know, for someone like me, it's like, okay, maybe that will happen. Maybe it won't happen. And thank goodness, you know, my family's healthy and all that stuff. But yeah, it's uh, it's not a small adjustment that people in Los Angeles are making. Most most people have a job that has vanished or has been impaired. And some people in restaurants are probably doing great because it's all to go, but they're probably selling more food than they ever have. And grocery stores, God knows, are selling much more food. I, think, I don't know where it's going. I, but, know. I, th I think there's a great opportunity for all the magicians, though, to work in the grocery stores. <laughs> not doing magic just stocking the shelves <laughs> anything we can do to earn a living I, i've got to tell you tim i've fallen prey to because it's i'm i'm homebound in la we've been told not to leave our home so even my kids haven't been visiting um uh, i've been buying magic tricks because all the <laughs> stores still want to sell you stuff Thank and you. i'm i'm loving it I have to admit, even if it's something I don't think I'll end up doing, like a coin effect that's silent, that's not, not really my style. Um, I do love magic. And uh, I'm talking a lot, mostly because I've been doing nothing but drink, drink caffeine all day. Uh, I love magic to death. And I love it so much. I always worked to make sure I had it as my love and my obsession and my tension release, my therapy. Uh, and yes, I did, to answer your question, you asked 10 minutes ago, I've been making my living as a writer, producer, and, you know, managing to get from job to job, and like, like most people. And magic, I always thought would be okay, I can put that away and just have magic, which besides the fact I'm not athletic, did I mention I'm Jewish? I'm, uh, <laughs> magic, as you know, Tim, occupies your mind yeah. and body. Absolutely. When you're working on something, you're completely involved. I find that very therapeutic and I love it for that reason. I love it for the problems uh, you tackle with magic. I love trying to uh, untie those knots. Sometimes you fail. Don't even mind that because at this point, you know, after you've been alive long enough, you know, that's part of the process. You will fail. And then it's fail, fail, fail. And then one day it's something lovely and you go, great i had to fail these six times but look look what's here now and uh it's i don't know many better feelings than that so yeah i love magic and i wanted to preserve my love for it and on a you know, personal i guess that was personal but in an even more intimate way the business i'm in with writing you're always selling and selling is another way of saying do you love me now do you love me now here now do a tap dance do you love me now do you love this joke I said? Do you love that joke? I mean, it's just, everything's an audition. And in magic, um, I do not take for granted. I have friendships in magic. I, you know, because I, I put out tricks and I do some writing, uh, I get to go places where there are magicians that are happy to see me. And when I walk into a room, instead of going out do you, going, do you have to, we love me now, we love me now, which is 
selling your idea or pitching your idea. When I uh, talk to magicians, it's a very positive experience. It's very, uh, you know, life affirming. It's very up, up. And every time I do it, I appreciate the fact that I can do it. Uh, and to go to the grisly side of life, magic has pulled my ass out of the fire on many occasions financially. Because, um, you know, I did preface this by saying I never looked to it for money. My, my book 10 years ago was called Approaching Magic. Um, I had been working on the book for a while, but then I had, it was one of these years where I was sure I was going to be employed because I had offers and it's all going to work. And it didn't work. I don't know what happened, but like whatever I thought was happening didn't. And that's when you look at your wife and you go, oops. So I finished the book and I'd always worked with outside publishers. And I thought, well, look, this is probably, I don't know how much longer books are going to be loved by magicians. Because at that time we didn't know. It seemed like, oh, video is taking over. I don't know. This could be the tail end of books. I will publish it myself, print, have it printed myself, which means you spend the money. But two other things happen. Uh, one is, it's exactly the book you want. When you're doing it yourself, and you think, I would love to have a hot stamped logo inside the, you know, the dust jacket. You know what? No one says no. <laughs> no one says no. And that's a great feeling. Getting exactly the book you want. Uh, and then the other thing that could potentially happen is, if it catches on, you're, gonna, you're not going to make you know, twice as much money as you would otherwise. You'll make many times more money than you would otherwise. And in a year where all my work had fell through that I had lined up, that book 10 years ago found a very strong audience. And when something like that happens, I am very grateful to the fact that magic's in my life for a completely different reason. And I, I assiduously didn't want to make it the only reason to make money because I felt it'd be in my life not the right mix. And I don't say that because I disparage gigging magicians. I love gigging magicians. Uh, in fact, up till very recently, I felt very uncomfortable around magicians because they were gigging and my contribution, whatever my contribution is, is an oddball contribution. You know, I like writing magic. And by that, I don't mean scripts to effects. I consider writing magic everything that happens in front of the, the audience. Well, David Copperfield has a great quote where he said, uh, David Regal understands more than magic. He understands the moment. Well, that's very sweet. But uh, we, all, we all are in the same uh, line of work. We're tilling the same fields. And we come at it in different ways, thank God. And yeah, I, when I look at magic, it's like, I, th I thought it was going to be a songwriter when I was a young guy. So I'm writing a lot of songs. I approach magic like writing a song. Hmm. And absolutely, when you start playing a song for people, you might think, oh, I want to change the bridge. Oh, I want to get to the chorus faster. But you're approaching it as a writer. And a lot of the times, you'll write it and you'll like what you wrote. Not every time, but it's a different way of approaching. In magic, people approach it from very different ways. And I, I don't disrespect that, but I always came at it in a different way just because of my background. And I felt sometimes like there was a uh, communication problem. People look at me like, what are you talking about? You have to go on a road with it for six months, then you start working on this and this. And of course, of course you learn stuff when you perform. Of course you do. But of course you can approach it uh, from a creative standpoint as well. And I love the process. That specifically is what's been hard for me to admit. <laughs> because if I was, if I was a working magician, I would want my 12 tricks there. Hmm. And I'm, I have a very bad habit 
if I was a working magician, because I love the process. I love throwing out what I've done before and just just seeing what, what else can, can happen and what else I can figure out. Like I was booked at the Magic Castle a few months ago. I did four tricks in the parlor and two of them were new tricks. <laughs> because I think we actually have footage of those two tricks, but I'm going to put in the links down below. Oh, do you? Yeah, I did put them online because someone has to see them. I guess they're still up there. They but, are, they're, they're uh, great. There's um, lovers in the air. Yeah, that's new. I'm true. I got to put both in Genie Magazine, I think this year, because uh, people have asked about them. But yeah, I mean, they're not in this book. They were since this book. They're after this book. And so I've, I've done stuff in this book, but I was doing that the last 10 years. And for me, the process, um, I think from a place of just ego, I love, if, if it works out, I love the fact that it's there and it wasn't there before. And I do think that's ego. It's like, like, like a cook who made it's something. A healthy ego though. Okay. I mean, I, I don't hate myself for it, <laughs> but I did feel awkward about it up until very recently. That yeah. no, what I like is the process. I'm allowed to like what I like. I was down on myself for liking specifically what I liked, just giving myself a problem. And yeah, I used to open up my close-up case at the Magic Castle because I used to perform, you know, the, the carbonara effect did not shoot in LA. So yeah. I've been performing occasionally. I perform on cruise ships and at the Magic Castle, and that's kind of it in between when I have some time. But when I worked at the Magic Castle more, because I had more jobs in LA, I'd open up my close-up kit and I'd go, oh, you guys again. I didn't want to see those guys again. I wanted new guys. <laughs> <laughs> I understand and that I just, entirely. I just did. <laughs> well, you, you've also created some of the most iconic tricks in magic, including Sudden Deck, where oh, uh, thank you. it's like, it's been around for a long time and you've, you've evolved it as it goes. And I, I use that. And it's going to continue to evolve a little bit. Yeah. I, I use that as the opening in my uh, show, which is, uh, uh, well, would have been playing in this theatre at the moment, but it's not for obvious reasons. And uh, I, I think I first encountered you with uh, Pasteboard Massacre. Well, I was very pleased to see that you did that trick, Tim. <laughs> yeah. um, I, changed I, it. I, I say that for two reasons. One is, first of all, I never withhold a compliment. I just decided at one point in my life, why withhold a compliment? It's not like people are angry to receive it. So you'll get a compliment out, Tim. I just hold you in such high regard as an artist and performer that you just do a version, because really your version is really your own, exactly. of that trick. Uh, uh, it makes me very, very happy. And that trick has made me happy for a long time for interesting reasons. Well, first I came up with it a long time ago and I sold it outright to Marietta. That doesn't make me happy. <laughs> no, no. Marietta is one of my good, good friends. And uh, I just said, okay, I was so thrilled that he wanted to put it out. But what happened when I put out that trick was such an education to me because when I did the trick for mayor, one is selected, it's a free choice and they can sign it. Uh, and then it goes back in the deck. You talk about how a card expert can cut to your card because you know, they're a card expert. Then you take out a card, you, they don't know what you're about to do and you start to saw the deck as if you're cutting the cards that way. As you saw, half cards start falling to the floor. You stop about halfway through, you take the card you stopped at, and it's the signed card. It, it's a good trick. And I started doing it. And uh, I was happy when Mayor started to uh, market it. And then I went to a magic convention. And I got to tell you, Tim, for me getting into magic as an adult, I was deep into it as a kid. In college, I was you know, doing different things, got into music, and whatever, got back into it hard after college. And seeing like a trick in the tenants catalog, that was a deep thrill. And going to a magic convention and seeing one of the greatest demo guys who has ever lived, Arthur Emerson, mm -hmm. who came out with those great card effects, Emerson mm -hmm. and Wes. He is, my God, what a great demo guy. I mean, up there with Al Cohen, up there with the very best. You, you probably bought it, bought your own trick from him. I think I may have, but I'll <laughs> tell you, he taught me how to do my trick. Because Art didn't want to have to pick pieces up off the table or the floor. When I did it, they went all over the place. What Art did is, 
he took the car, he started sawing the deck, and then he added this beat with the car that's halfway in the deck is up, it's just sitting up in the deck like this. And you had this beautiful picture, a beautiful picture that was never there before. And then he'd table it, and it would still be like this. He'd take it up, put it there, take the two halves and spread them. Another huge beat, why? Because you're thinking, he, he didn't really cut the cards. He didn't really cut the cards. Boom. Yes, he did. And that moment, boom, hit so hard. That moment came from Art Emerson. And wow. then, so you have this card here. You have all the half cards and a beautiful ribbon spread here. Then you take this one off. You stop your fingers. And boom, it's their sign card. Played huge. And as he puts it away, it's reset. That's what Art Emerson did to Pasteboard Massacre. Took it from a thing where you're picking up 52 pieces of paper to a trick that resets and has more moments of impact. Yeah. So, and I did uh, the opposite. <laughs> well, I, you, I like it with cards going everywhere. And for stage, I continue to do it that way. Yeah. Yeah. But I, when I did it at the Magic Castle, and it was my act, in my act for 10 years, one of those tricks I could not take out because it just landed. Uh, you know, the, it landed with force. Mm. And uh, the version I did was Art Emerson's version. And that's one of the great things about magic, that you always reach a place of not knowing. And that's what I loved about, you know, we did over 100 episodes of The Carbon Hour Effect, and no card tricks, mm. not even tricks that, well, it's really a card trick, but we made it look like something else. No, no card tricks. Mm. And very often, we were doing something for the first time. And we weren't going to do it another day because the structure of the show is we go to location X, whatever it is, a bowling alley or a convenience store. We do a few effects and we're gone. We never go there again. And these are not generic effects. We're creating effects for that location that wouldn't make sense in another location. And there's a high anxiety factor because tricks that you haven't worked on and you're doing for the first time very often because we're working on the materials for the night before very often or the techniques the night before yeah. we're doing them for real people on camera and if they fail obviously they never see the light of day but we had a pretty good hit rate but um i said this apropos of what oh yeah not knowing We'd be in a van driving to this location. Sometimes it was an hour drive. And we wouldn't know if it was going to work. Sometimes in a very meaningful way, like we're trying some things that are audacious. It could be a product with a unique attribute where it seems like we're pushing believability a little further than normal. And is someone really gonna buy that? But other times it, it ran deep, like, can we make a man think he turned invisible? Really make him feel he's invisible? Or can we make a woman believe she saw Santa Claus? Can we make a guy, a young man, think garden gnomes in a garden have come to life in some eerie way? Things that no one would believe if we hit them straight on with that. Or like seeing a mermaid. Can, what, what was the strongest one of those effects? What was the, the one that's... I can't say there was the strongest one because uh, this show has a high bar. Mm. And they're not, by that I mean, most are good. Some are otherworldly. Mm. And it's a combination of factors. I mean, we did this bit with the gnomes and everything about it was wrong. Everything about it was wrong. We, I wanted like a three foot high gnome, a whole bunch of three foot high gnomes. All they could find were like these little gnomes. How is that gonna be scaring, pardon me, anybody? We were doing it behind a guy's house. I think someone on the crew, their house, the light was all bad. Half the place was in shadow, half wasn't. But uh, without obviously telling you how things worked, because uh, contractually I can't do that. Uh, the interesting ones worked on many, many levels and required a lot of uh, interesting thinking. For example, one of our great weapons was Michael. Michael as a performer is unique and I had nothing to do with his live show. His live show was fantastic for almost opposite reasons. I mean, Michael's very likable on TV and on 
stage, but on stage he's projecting this personality uh, that is very present and everyone feels he's in the room with them. Not like going to a Vegas show, you feel this person just, you know, there's some fourth wall up, you're not really meeting the person. Michael has this amazing uh, uh, ability to project that personality. But on TV, in the context of this show, no one can think they're seeing a magic trick. The Marks can't think they're seeing a magic trick. They can't think they're seeing a magician. Michael is always there in the context of the boss. He's a boss or your co-employee or he's the cashier. He's never a magician. Uh, and so he has to be believable. He has to play things at a level where people are credulous. And he is fantastic at that. Uh, so that is one of our great weapons. Another great weapon is when we hit on a mark. And I don't think it's always because we're canny or our casting people are canny. When I say cast, if we're in a location like someone's backyard, we will hire someone. They think they are going to be a landscape assistant that day. They don't think they're going to be on TV or on a prank show. They think they're going to be a landscape assistant, but that's a way to bring someone where we need them. Mm. So sometimes we get lucky with a mark. That's also a weapon, having the right mark. But the other part of that tripod is the writing. And a lot of care goes into the good bits. By a lot of care, to make something believable that's audacious, uh, and this doesn't break any confidences, as you might imagine, you can't just go for it. People are not stupid. And people will be quick to go, oh, is this some prank show I'm on? And what eventually becomes the craft is, how do you stair step to a place where they're susceptible? How do you get them off balance with a few of these little you know, preambles? that makes them tell you, hey, here's what I think's going on, because when they're convincing you, instead of you trying to convince them, you're on a correct path. And if they take a few of those steps toward the abyss, they are susceptible. And then you can give them a little nudge toward that audacious thing that in a normal situation, they would not be prone to believe. Because these are not we're not looking for the stupid people of the world. We had uh, sometimes extraordinarily intelligent people. But when they get to that place of vulnerability where uh, things just aren't quite as they should and they're off balance, they will fall. And Michael's superpower is making them not mad when he has to tell them on a TV show because he really does like these people. Yeah. And he really does feel for them and the experience they've been through. And Michael likes doing scary shit. So when we do something scary, I think Michael's gift is particularly rare because it's not just ha ha, we were doing a prank show. It has to be, I'm going to tell you something and you might not like it, but I want you to know. And Michael has a way of doing it where they just continue to love him. And, uh, you know, I can't, say I know how he does it, but it's unique. But that's fantastic advice, not just for that sort of a show, but also for magic in general. And I guess a lot of that uh, comes out in your books, uh, both of the books. And uh, I'm going to put links down there so people can find your books very easily. And we'll also uh, mention about a lot of the uh, tricks you've got there, uh, because as, as we have this long, long period of isolation, as you said, it's great to buy new tricks, learn new tricks, and it's also great to support each other, support all the magicians who are out there. But I want to just... Well, you uh, know what I'm, it's, it's funny you should say that, because yeah. I was thinking, uh, and you're the first person to hear this, and it, this, I don't think this can apply around the world. I'm only going to be able to do this domestically. When I heard my book was selling out, yeah. I had them send me some cartons of the first printing, because I figured I'll always want to have some to give us gifts for the rest of my life or whatever here, you know, whatever, have some cartons. And I thought because of the situation, I'll just, a carton is six copies. I'll give away six copies. And so I think tomorrow uh, I'll do something online where I'll say, you know what? The book's called Interpreting Magic. It's all, I mean, there's a lot of tricks in here and not just card tricks, all kinds of props and not just close-up material. 
stuff for stand up. My favorite section here is stand up material uh, with unusual props. Um, but I'll just say to people, it doesn't have to be one of my tricks. Any trick you do, where you feel you're interpreting it in some way, it's a little bit different than when someone else does it. It's not a contest. You put up videos on this chain and we'll just all enjoy watching them for a week and then I'll pull them from a hat. So you're not competing. You know, it's not a competition. Okay. But everyone who does post a video of them doing a trick, just one trick, your names will go into a hat and then maybe I'll do, uh, I may, I've never done a live FaceTime anything, a Facebook thing, but maybe I'll do that and I'll pull out six names and just send them all a book. But I can only do that domestically because the cost to send overseas yeah. for me is prohibitive. But yeah, I'll give away six copies. All right, so all our American viewers, please uh, post your videos underneath the, the comments here. Uh, probably best but on- You should be able to get this. I mean, a lot of these big stores do it with very cheap or free shipping, even to Australia. So check those big stores. And I want to tell you, since you brought this up, <laughs> half the book is tricks. It's a big book. And the other half is, well, it's called Interpreting Magic because uh, in a lot of ways, I compare magic to music. Uh, in music, people buy, a singer buys the sheet music, but doesn't go, now I'm a singer, now I'm done. We know in music, that song is going to be interpreted by the singer. When we go to see a singer, it's because we expect interpretation. No one says, honey, put on your best dress. We're about to see a singer that's like every other singer. No, we don't go to see a sports team. That's the same as every sports team. We want an, and expect interpretation. Interestingly, in magic, just because we have this thing called the secret, and we're se we love secrets. I love secrets. I buy stuff all the time. I want to know the secret because we want those weapons. But that's what they are. They're a weapon. They're useful. We all want the best secret for the job and the arena. Who wouldn't? But it's not the end. And we tend to think it's the end. Now I have the secret, I'm done. No, no, you're like a, a singer with a sheet music. Now you have means to continue. So in this book, in a very down to earth, nuts and bolts way, I talk about, as I did with my last book, very simple things you can do to make it so when you do this trick, it's gonna be a little bit different than when someone else does it. And it's easy and it makes it more fun for you performing and makes it a different experience for the people watching it. Uh, so I'm a big believer in that. With anyone that's any good in magic, no one confuses David Copperfield with David Blaine. That's never happened. And there's a reason for that. They're interpreting magic. Penn and Teller interpret it a different way. And it's not about, I'm not saying who does it better. I'm just saying these are different interpretations of how to do magic, how to perform magic. Uh, and sometimes, it's just a little wrinkle. Sometimes it's a big character. You know what? It's going to be different for different people, but it's not a job completely done until there's interpretation. So I get into that, and part of that is talking to over 30 of the best magic minds in the world. And uh, I did it over a period of many years and in different places. And I found the end result. Uh, each one individually I like, but taken as a whole, very inspiring and uplifting because at the end of the day, you realize all these people have just walked forward, not knowing if they would succeed or not, and certainly not succeeding a lot of the time, but occasionally achieving beauty. And to me, seeing how they all were there in a the garage, all they're just trying, uh, there was something very welcoming about that. And I appreciated that. I don't think it's possible to read all these interviews and not pick, pick up on that and break through, you know, that creative paralysis that hits most people uh, now and then because it is a, a commonality we all share. No one ever achieved anything any good without, you know, tripping uh, or falling down. And you realize that talking to these people, not that they're, it's not that talking to 30 people is not every great magician in the world, but they're not all performers. Some are uh, illusion designers or trick designer for Tenyo. Uh, people who come at magic from different ways. And so that's part of the book too. And 
I'm thrilled that I got to capture some of these conversations. A few of them have passed on since I've, uh, I've worked on this book for 10 years. And of those, the 10 years, some of them passed on. And I'm proud that I have, you know, Johnny Thompson saying some really interesting things. Eugene Berger, he, he kind of broke my heart by saying something. And it's something another very good magician already found controversial. And I don't mind that. There's people who disagree with each other in this book. There's people I disagree with in this book. That, it's not about agreement. And it's not about doing magic the way I do it or the way any one of these other people do it. It's about finding a road uh, to doing magic the way you do it. And, uh, you know, that, that's what makes magic this eternal, fantastic thing for all of us. It's not about buying a trick and because you have the secret, now you're doing it and you're done. It's this thing with no end that's a physical and intellectual pursuit and gives people pleasure in the most efficient way I've ever seen in my life. Well, I, can tell, you, I can tell you the reviews have been fantastic for people are saying it's another instant classic. But uh, I'm fortunate I'm going to have to wrap it up now. It's been fantastic having you here in the Laneway Theatre virtually and hopefully one day soon we'll get you down in Australia in reality. Thank you so much for sharing all that information. It's been a, a wealth of knowledge and uh, hopefully we'll see you again very, very soon. But bye for now. See you later. about you, Tim, but when I visit a new town, I like to get out about four in the morning the night before and see what that town is like. So this place, Burbank, before I moved here, I came at four in the morning, walked around, and I met the most interesting man. He said, hey, come here, you want to play a game? Hmm, seemed like a sweet guy, guys. It's called Find the Queen. If you find the queen, I'll give you $5. If you don't find the queen, you have to give me five dollars. Well, I don't like losing five dollars, but he did seem like a nice guy, and there's no one else to talk to in that abandoned bus terminal. So I figured, why the heck not? And I said, now, look, I'm going to try and fool you a little bit. I have jokers too. I'm going to throw the queen in with the jokers, see if you can find it. And he started slow. I like that about him. He started slow. Then he did. He did what I call the schmegly do. This is what it looks like. Wham, wham, wham. Whoa, too fast, too fast. I guess there he said, oh, sorry, you owe me five bucks. Wanna play again? I don't like losing five bucks, but he did say he was sorry, right? So I figured, okay, we'll try again. And he started slow, started slow. Then he did the schmegly do, wham, wham, wham. And then he added one, too much, too much. I guess there he said, oh, now you owe me 10 bucks. Well, now I know I'm not dealing with a nice old man. I'm dealing with a piece of scum out to steal my hard-earned money. So I figured, just one more time. I paid close attention. Now, I think you should too. Close attention. Oh, I watched where he put every card, but one in particular, and then he did this. What did that have to do with anything? All I know is at the end of the day, I owed him five, ten. $15. I will never pay cards with that guy again.